and thank you for coming to this um, to this press conference in the context of the business day organized by um, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. My name is Ivo de Boer. I am KPMG's Special Global Advisor on Climate Change and Sustainability. And what I wanted to do was talk to you a little bit today about a report which KPMG has just launched under the title Future Proofing Business in the Gulf Cooperation Council uh, Region, Opportunities for Sustainable Growth within the Gulf Cooperation Council region. It's a, it's a report that we prepared since the COP is being held uh, here in Qatar because we felt it was an important opportunity to highlight some of the specific challenges and opportunities that this region is, uh, is confronted with. And on the, the, the challenges side, the issues are, are quite significant in the sense that businesses in the Gulf Cooperation Council region face unique risks in the face of, uh, of global climate change and sustainability in areas such as energy use, population growth, water scarcity, uh, and, and other mega forces. If you compare this region to other parts of the world, then it's interesting to note that just 11% of the 75 largest companies in the GCC region have a sustainability strategy, uh, a policy, or a vision as compared to 95% of companies in Europe and 85% of companies in the United States. In other words, companies in this region have a significant journey still to make in terms of sustainability strategy. But it's not only in relation to strategy that the challenges are great. As many of you are aware, per capita energy consumption in the region is already extremely high, with the UAE, Qatar, Kuwait amongst the highest in the world and this energy consumption is predicted to double between 2008 and 2020, uh, according to our report. We have found that energy efficiency in this region is less than half of that of the European Union, that GCC uh, industries, manufacturers and retailers will require robust energy efficiency strategies and may need to adjust product design if they are to compete effectively uh, internationally and the trend in the GCC is now to promote and develop renewable energy solutions, manage energy demand, and rationalize domestic use of, uh, of hydro powder, uh, uh, hydrocarbons. For example, Kuwait aims to generate 5% of its electricity from sustainable sources by 2020, and Oman's target is to generate 10% of its electricity from renewable sources by, by 2030. So in other words, trends in the right direction there. We've also found that fast economic development has brought rapid expansion and private wealth to the GCC region, uh, coupled with low energy prices in the region, and that as a result there has been significant prosperity, but this has brought with it challenges in terms of energy, water intensive culture, um, that in turn has created unique challenges in the domain uh, of the environment, this particular part of the region, if compared to the global average, will probably be confronted with significantly greater uh, temperature increase. Um, from a political point of view, governments and businesses in the region are coming under increased international pressure to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that's logical given the fact that Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar and the UAE are currently the world's highest per capita carbon dioxide uh, emitters. Also, of course, energy and fuel challenges facing the region, as well as the, as the fact that due to economic prosperity in this particular part of the world, a significant uh, middle class is emerging, which is consuming more and more and therefore creating significantly greater pressures in terms of, of energy, water consumption, waste generation, uh, etc. So in other words, this region faces a number of very significant uh, challenges. At the same time, it's fair to say that the region is beginning to, to rise to that challenge. There's generally a recognition that in addition to the sustainability challenges that I talked about, this part of the world has a challenge in terms of needing to create 100 million jobs for young people in the next 20 years. And that will have to be done significantly through broad-based growth or economic diversification. Uh, a number of areas in which there is significant potential for that, uh, for example, in terms of, as I said, diversification of the economy, uh, changes in production and consumption patterns, which is clearly a priority for the region, possibilities to, to green business, 
possibilities around resource efficiency, and finally significant developments in terms of, of research and innovation. So in summary, what we found in the context of this report is that the, that the region is, is facing very significant and very specific challenges in terms of the broad sustainability agenda, so broader than climate change alone, that the recognition of those challenges is beginning to emerge in the region, and that companies in the different countries of the Gulf Cooperation Council are, um, are beginning to rise to that challenge and beginning to find new opportunities for innovation in new markets, recognizing that at the end of the day, companies in this part of the world need to compete on a global stage. So those are some of the major findings of uh, report that we're issuing today in the context of this conference of parties, and I'll be happy, uh, happy later in, in the conversations here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Eiffel. My name is Peter Bakker. I'm the president of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and together with Jean-Guy Carrier from ICC and in the afternoon with Eiffel, we have today held the Global Business Day here in Doha. Um, in the morning, we talked about the role of business in scaling up the solutions for uh, making the world a sustainable place. We had a number of presentations out there. Uh, Mr. Kilani from the UNFCCC came by, talked about um, the opportunities that energy efficiency offered, the need for scale and for action, and uh, he made a call on the private sector on business to actually step up uh, the amount of actions. Um, we then had um, input from uh, the science community. Dr. Miles Allen from Cambridge came out, had a very challenging presentation for the audience in the sense that he said it's, uh, it's not about carbon emissions per se, it's about the cumulative amount of carbon in the atmosphere, and that is what policies should be uh, striving to, uh, to reduce. And uh, he came with a very simple solution saying that carbon capture storage would be the solution that would solve all our problems. Uh, in the panel discussions later on, some of the panelists actually agreed with that as the route going forward. Others said that, of course, there's never one silver bullet. We need additional solutions as well, whether it's alternative fuels and carbon price and the likes. Um, the last panel in the morning, we had a mixed panel with representation from the World Bank, the minister from the UK was present and a couple of business leaders, and there was a real engaged dialogue between the, the, the different parties. During the morning, we have announced two bits of action, because I think the sense in the business community globally is now that we've been talking about these matters more than enough. We need to really try to get into action and scale that up. So we've announced a new concept called GEI, which is Global Electricity Initiative where now more than 30 electricity utilities are coming together, will um, report their sustainability efforts, their best practices together, and will do joint projects in the areas of adaptation, but also mitigation. A second project or a second piece of action that was announced in the Indian cement sector in collaboration with the IEA, the International Energy Agency, um, there's been a roadmap produced that will lead eventually to 45% reduction of CO2 in the Indian cement market, which might sound as a, a small announcement, but the savings potential of that roadmap is more than uh, the country of Indonesia today emits in total. So there's very significant industrial um, CO2 reductions to be coming from that. Um, then in the afternoon, uh, around the announcement of, uh, of the report by KPMG, there were two panel sessions with, um, with guests and speakers from this region, and I thought in particular the, the last one, where we had uh, the CEO of um, Sabik, Dr. Almadi, Dr. Almula from uh, the Qatar Petrochemical Company, Dr. Uh, also Waidi from the Qatar Fertilizer Company gave a very good perspective of what local business, regional business, uh, is doing uh, in making sustainability a core part of their activities. So I think all in all, a very good day of discussions. Um, generally low expectations for the outcome of the overall uh, sessions here in Doha. 
uh, but um, a, a growing sense of urgency amongst business leaders that action need to be stepped up. So, no, there's no button. There's no button. It's on. It's on. Good. Uh, my name is Jean-Guy Carrier. I'm a Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce. Um, and that is a network of companies, millions of them, uh, in just about every country of the world, over 120 in fact. Um, and our big concern, I think, as um, a business network is that uh, we are obviously still some distance away from having uh, uh, an agreement on rules which eventually would lead to some regulation internationally in, in this area. And there's a concern that that some uh, ambitious regions and quite creative and energetic ones of the world um, are beginning to come up with their own uh, carbon policies and carbon containment and, and, and so on uh, approaches. Um, we see it in Europe, we see it emerging in some other areas. And I think business is concerned that we'll end up with a proliferation of different rules and different regimes um, that uh, then business will need to accommodate to. And we'll have a reproduction, if you want, a replication of what has happened in, uh, in trade, for instance, with regional and bilateral trade agreements, where there are now nearly 500 of them around the world, um, in investment, where there's no international treaty and there's 3,000 bilateral treaties, so that often businesses, especially um, <clears throat> those who are not, uh, remain undaunted by that uh, challenge, uh, have to consult uh, their lawyers before they consult their investment advisors. Uh, just to simply um, uh, sort out what the, the different rules and regulations are from one jurisdiction to the next. Uh, if you're a multinational company or even a, a medium-sized company that's trading in many markets, this becomes very confusing. So there's a fear that that, that is the way we're going, that, that that's one of the costs of this inability to come to some agreement uh, in, in this context. I think the second thing is, is that, um, and certainly uh, we've been hearing it today, and uh, it's, it's a constant message as we come to these COP negotiations, um, that business is simply not waiting uh, for um, regulations to be put in place, um, that an awful lot of companies, small, medium, large companies, see uh, the advantage and the opportunity in, this, uh, in the green industries in, in terms of providing environmental products and goods and services. And um, I think there are some credible studies that show that uh, we're now attaining almost 100 billion uh, in investments per year just in developing countries. Um, so uh, almost at the level of what is proposed to be uh, the Global Climate Fund. So in that sense, I think that um, it's certainly uh, an encouraging sign that business has sees that there is uh, a, a business in this sort of activity, uh, that it is uh, creating jobs and, and uh, creating growth and also dealing with the climate issues uh, in the course of doing uh, their business. That's basically, I think, the two messages that I wanted to leave. But uh, the first one, I think, is, is the one with the biggest point of consternation, that uh, we, are, uh, we could be going into a world where, in fact, there's a kind of fracturing of uh, and a multiplication of different approaches to dealing with this, since we can't have an international um, a concord on uh, climate issues. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone have a question? Wait yes, could you please say, wait, well, wait for the microphone, please. Say who you are and who you're posing the question to. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Thomas Hickmann from the University of Potsdam in Germany. And I have a very basic question. Um, you all said um, that companies are undertaking different activities, different um, actions to reduce greenhouse gases. And from your perspective, um, then how important still is the UNFCC process? And um, yeah, very directly, um, do you think that yeah, these negotiations uh, taking place sometimes behind closed doors um, are still necessary? What do you think about uh, this issue? Well, my view is that uh, a global treaty on climate change is, uh, is incredibly important. 
especially from the perspective of creating a, a, a level playing field and policy clarity for, uh, for the business community. I think there's a great deal that, that the business community can do on its own, and in fact the business community is doing on its own. But at the end of the day, you need clear, predictable, long-term, uh, stable policy frameworks that will make it possible for business to go the extra mile. And that is what these negotiations should be, uh, should be all about. So it's about creating policy clarity, giving a sense of ambition, and driving a level playing field. Yeah, and I, I would add to that, if you look at the topic of climate change, this is probably one of the first truly global um, challenges that humanity faces. And, you know, we should continue to put every effort in reaching a global agreement and how that is going to uh, be addressed. And should we continue to not succeed, then indeed business will will have to put in place actions because it's not only the climate that is at risk or, or, or the society as we know it, but also the con continuity of business. But then you immediately run into the point that, uh, that you are making in the sense that we'll then end up with many local or regional sets of, uh, of policies uh, which are likely not to be consistent, which distorts competi competitiveness and um, and will make you know product adjustments to these policies just very ineffective. So I think we all think it is much better to aim for it, um, but realistically speaking, you know the progress is uh, rather slow. Yeah, I'll just add that the um, the hundred billion I mentioned, for instance, in terms of, uh, of private sector investment, um, is pretty small when you consider the real need um, in in terms of coping with the, the situation in real terms and, and doing it as quickly as possible. Um, and reaching uh, a, an international agreement remains uh, primary in terms of in, in importance, in terms of inspiring some confidence. Um, I mean, there are an awful lot of companies, an awful lot of capital out there that, is, uh, that would be um, disposable for, uh, available rather, for investment. Uh, in, in climate uh, engineering and climate products and services um, that is holding back because uh, the rules are not always clear enough. And, and so just at that level, to unlock more private sector uh, investment, it would be uh, very useful and well, it would be necessary to have an international agreement. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much for having come uh, to this press conference. And if you're interested in the publication that I just talked about, we have copies here at the front for, for those of you that are interested. Thank you very much for having come. Thank you. Thanks.